Okay, welcome to another seminar with Robin D. Laws, which is uh, called Advanced Gaming Lore. Uh, it's the follow-up seminar of the one we had this morning, which was Fix My Game, Robin. Um, the initiative goes back to a certain Jeff Richard, who said, let's ask Robin the really tough questions and see if he, what his answer might be. And one of them was... I believe it was on double blind investigation. Yes. Wasn't it? So, Robin, how would you run a double blinded investigation as a game master? So, you basically, you have two rival, your NPCs or uh, your, the, your player characters are doing a blind investigation, mm -hmm. fumbling around the dark, and you, as the GM, are trying to have them. Part of the tension is being created that there is somebody else doing the same investigation that you want to make sure that they don't get. Right. Um, so, uh, I, so, so basically, it's the uh, John Polito and the Volkswagen mm -hmm. outside the dude's uh, house. So there's some other investigator. So that's the secret: is that you have to introduce that threat as soon as possible. Of someone else is trying to find out the same information you are, and you need to have a consequence of why that would be a bad thing. So the um, the thing that you're the mystery that you're trying to uncover has to have an expiration date or some kind of zero sum reward. So let's say, you know, it would have to be like the Maltese Falcon, right? Mm -hmm. That you're uh, all trying to find, you know, you're trying to find the Maltese Falcon and uh, early on you discover that someone else is trying to also find the Falcon. And so uh, in Gumshoe, for example, uh, there are, we try to make sure that there are always multiple paths through the mystery, that there isn't one particular order in which you do all of the scenes and at the end you get to the end scene and you've discovered the mystery because of course that deprives the players of choice so uh, there are what I call core scenes in which you uh, you know the most obvious plot uh, between th the most obvious journey through the scenes to the mystery at the end it would be the all the core scenes but then there are alternate scenes in which you can get much the same information, or you can do the, you know, a more circuitous route through all of the scenes. So what I would do then is whenever you have a choice point between different leads to investigate, so for example in, in scene A, uh, you discover that the Falcon is in the city and uh, it may either be in, uh, and there's two antique dealers that might possibly know something about that. Um, and ideally, if this were not an example that I was spinning off the top of my head, it would be <laughs> more, a more interesting choice than two of the same thing. Um, but uh, so, uh, or, or, you know, okay, let's say there's an antiques dealer and there's a zookeeper. Who knows why the zookeeper knows where the falcon oh, is? But uh, so um, if you then choose the antiques dealer, uh, you get to the antiques dealer first, but when you go to the. If, uh, if you then later go to the zookeeper, the other investigator has already been there. And there's some extra impediment. Uh, it just may be that the person is, and, and early, early on in the first one, it would be, he's just more reluctant to talk to you. It takes more effort to get him to open up because I've ar already told all of this to the last guy. Don't you guys coordinate? And that's when you, oh, wait a minute, there's somebody else in the case. And then the identity of who the, uh, is also shadowing you in the investigation becomes part of the mystery. And so maybe that person has the lead they originally had and now they have a lead that could take you to, you know, who's this other investigator. And so um, it would be a matter of mapping out the different uh, choices and determining, uh, you know, if you're three scenes in when you get to scene, uh, you know, if you're reaching the, the scene and, in the lighthouse and uh, there have only been three scenes so far. You're getting to the investigation fresh, but after that, the other person has been there. And so for each of those scenes that you build in, there's an additional problem. And the problems hopefully escalate as you go along so that uh, the lighthouse scene might be one where he's, uh, the other investigator has paid the lighthouse keeper to try and hit you on the head with a wrench when uh, he shows up and, and uh, capture you and Maybe you don't, you know, maybe being captured is not really the consequence, but it's the threat, and you can still get bonked on the head and lose some health points or, or what have you. And so that would, uh, 
and as you constructed that, as you went along, finally the last, uh, you know, final confrontation is uh, with, uh, you know, once you've dealt with whatever the main, whoever has a falcon, then you know that the other investigator is going to come through the door and have the drop on you and the advantages that they've accrued uh, by that uh, time uh, will, uh, you know, determine the nature of the final encounter. Or you can uh, take the choice of deciding to be aggressive about the person who's following you and say, well, I'm going to stop looking for the falcon for a while because I know if I just ignore uh, John Polito in the, in the Volkswagen that he's going to try and get the drop on me in the end and take the falcon. So I'm going to be uh, proactive about that find him, negate him first, so that it's not a double-blind investigation anymore, because that sucks. Let's make it a single-blind investigation, and then, uh, so you would have the option to do that as well. And you would, um, um, you think for purposes, if, if you were developing it for purposes of generating suspense, uh, you'd be a nice, because it sounds like the way you're writing it, you're, you're writing it as the, the fair GM, <coughs> where uh, my actions as the player are going to affect how, uh, at what point I introduce in the, um, um, uh, the various, the, the other investigators have screwed me, as opposed to simply saying, uh, which I uh, was kind of imagining from a hero quest perspective, I just basically look at if the characters are really successful, then that's when I, I pull the rug from underneath their, their, their feet. With right. Um, in uh, gumshoe terms, uh, that is shifting the double blind investigation to something simpler and easier to do, which is they become what we call in that structure an antagonist reaction. Right. So he, the, in that case, the other investigator becomes a secondary antagonist. Um, and um, there's an example of that in one of the upcoming. Uh, gumshoe one-to-one scenarios where there's uh, an insurance investigator who uh, decides that you're the one who's committed the crime instead of the one investigating the crime and uh, harasses you uh, through the course of the case. So uh, in that instance, uh, it doesn't really matter. He's not really trying to solve the mystery. He's actually got his own wrong idea of what's going on and he's become an additional obstacle to you. And uh, how uh, well you... uh, deal with him depends on uh, how many sidetracks you take in the, in the case. Uh, in that game system, uh, bad things can happen to you, and you can get rid of them by taking time. Uh, so for example, if you get clunked by the lighthouse keeper with the wrench, and uh, you've been injured, and there's no hit points in this system. Uh, Gumshoe one-to-one is the upcoming uh, retooling of Gumshoes for uh, one GM and one player. And it's an interesting design challenge because a lot of the things that we take for granted as being necessary in role playing actually aren't relevant to Mm -hmm. essentially solo play or solo play with a GM. And so one of those things that it takes away is there's no hit point system anymore. Um, uh, Instead, what you get are are we give you, uh, if you fail a particularly challenge badly enough, you will get a, a negative card that you are given to hold on to and uh, it's called a problem card, uh, and so that could be any. Uh, the nature of that could be anything. But if it's a physical injury, you know, you could get a concussion card, and so if you get a concussion when the lighthouse keeper bunch of the wrench, uh, you can take time by going to your doctor friend, and he can kind of treat you, and you can, you know, feel better or just get a couple of days bed rest, um, and you get rid of that card. But that also means there are uh, the antagonist reactions will trigger. So. While you're in bed uh, with your concussion, then John Polito comes through the window with a gun and points it at you. Um, but that's a little different than being no, no. a double blind investigation. That's an additional, you know, secondary antagonist that you have to deal with. Come on, guys. Anyone else have a high level of question? So the one that I wake a little bit is the notion of uh, kind of recurring them. So players obviously when they meet opposition have a tendency to want to neutralize the threat of the opposition. Right. And the question is how you do something that gives them somebody that recurs and therefore becomes a menace that they grow to hate until you have a kind of final showdown um, without railroading in particular um, or removing their agency from particular scenarios or just to resorting to the one bounty was free. Right. Um, well, if you look at the way that that is done in serial television, uh, for example, uh, both Arrow and The Flash 
use the conceit of each season has a big bad. And there's a reason why uh, The Flash can't just defeat Zoom or why Arrow can't just defeat Damien Dark. And that's basically their stats are way up here. So that uh, they are, uh, those villains are such physical threats that the, the uh, heroes know right away that they're either going to have to get uh, way better in order to possibly deal with them, which is the uh, basically the theme of season two of The Flash as he's trying to get uh, fast enough to actually not be wiped out by Zoom the next time he fights him. And they establish that early on by just having the, car- the bad guy show up and just you know, beat the crap out of the Flash. Um, and, or the arrow is that uh, they have to find a way to, to neutralize his power. And they, you know, do that one time and it kind of works and then it doesn't work and they have to find another way to do it. So uh, in both of those cases, there's a reason throughout the narrative or until the end of the narrative why he can't just... Uh, the, the characters can't just confront the bad guy and beat him, and that's just because, you know, his stats are just off the chart, which is super easy to do. For example, in Hero Quest, um, and uh, you know, in a, and there was a Hero Quest game where uh, it was sort of a version of ancient uh, Greece that uh, we ran. It was a Greek city state, and uh, Theseus originally seemed to be their pal, but then it turned out Theseus was a big jerk because he's a Greek hero. They're all jerks. Um, <laughs> And it was established that early on, it's like, oh, I, if you're giving me static, I, I should, have, in all fairness, inform you that I could pluck out one of my eyelashes and kill you with that as my weapon. And, and, you know, and that established a threat, and they knew then that they, if they were going to take out Theseus, the physical attack was not the way they were going to do that. Uh, because uh, you know, it, it is a, a truism in gaming that if you give an enemy stats, the player characters can kill them. And that's true, but you can give them stats that they can't defeat. That's, that's a simple matter of math, you know? We're, we're all thinking of the uh, deities and demigods, uh, uh, AD&D gods, but, but the, you know, they only had 400 hit points. That was the problem. <laughs> give them 12,000 hit points. That'll be... That'll solve that. Throw the crimson of that into request. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I have a piggybacking the first question about mysteries. I have been thinking about this. That how do you ensure that the, if it's a mystery or like a, there's some kind of that you have to find out, and, uh, and so how how do you ensure that the, there has come the problem that my character would be able to solve this, but I as a player cannot solve the mystery um. behind. So how do you ensure that the, the characters actually can <laughs> solve it. Um, and so this is basically the whole issue that um, my gumshoe game system is all about. And it's uh, <laughs> all about solving mysteries. And the information uh, is basically provided to you under several series of circumstances. So first of all, when you enter a, a, a scene where there's uh, information to be had, uh, the players might start by you know, saying what they do to look for things, and they might invoke the skills that they're using in order to find stuff, and they may also uh, uh, just tell you what they're doing, and you may be able to intuit what the skills are, and then as they kind of run out of ideas into the scene, uh, you then supply what they would look for if they were experts in, uh, so one of the abilities is forensic entomology, let's say, and uh, if the if the player who has that ability doesn't stop to check and see if there are uh, you know uh, bugs on the corpse uh, at the end of the scene, you say, well, well, as a forensic entomologist, of course, you would check under the fingernails and you would find uh, these tiny uh, eggs and you would recognize that uh, you know whatever the significance of that is. It's usually about the timing of death in the case of forensic entomology. And so uh, the idea in Gumshoe is to give you all sorts of information and then you figure out what the significance of that is when you uh, start to put it together. And uh, the answer then is basically there's a group of people 
who are all kind of working together to figure out what's going on. And you have to make the mystery clear enough that once you do have all the pieces that you can put it together. So it's just as in when you're writing a mystery novel, if you uh, give, uh, come up with a, an extremely weird solution to the mystery that the reader could not have possibly puzzled through, that's regarded as cheating. But in, in role playing, there's an even worse consequence, which is as you suggest, they just don't get the mystery. And often the reason that they can't put the mystery together is not that it's too impossibly hard, but just that they've forgotten key information. So once they get to the stage where they know everything and they're trying to assemble it and put it together, the GM can provide a certain amount of guidance and, for example, suggest, um, well, maybe, uh, uh, you know, you for, uh, I noticed no one is mentioning the uh, documents that you found under the, under the drawer earlier on. So don't forget those, and that, that'll help click them. So a good GM can kind of guide people along through the deliberation process without obviously just going, hey, look at this. This is clearly the thing, right? And uh, it's, uh, So it's a matter of assuming good cooperation between the scenario writer in that they're not making the mystery too hard and the GM in the, their ability to sort of uh, guide uh, players who get stuck. So it's, it's not a complaint that we get a lot with Gumshoe that they can't figure out the mysteries because we've got all this support for it, basically. Uh, there are certain films that have structure that uh, that's basically, it's an investigative, investigative, investigative uh, theme going on. And uh, you basically have two timelines and you start with the nowadays, timeline and uh, the uh, investigator is uh, uh, talking with the diff different people and you give, you give uh, I, I uh, talk with you and the uh, timeline changes to 10 years back right. and you give yeah. this sort of story then I <coughs> talk with Jeff and then he gives that sort of story right. and it it's plays out in the film. Right, it, it, it dramatizes the flashbacks. Yeah, so uh, how would you do that sort of structure in role playing game. Um, I'm not sure I would. Uh, I'm not sure I would go to flashbacks in investigative uh, role playing. Although, as you point out, that is something that you do see in some films. Uh, Horns, uh, which is the uh, yeah. adaptation of the uh, Joe Hill novel uh, with Daniel Radcliffe in it, uses precisely that. And in film, that's a substitute for the fact that. Uh, just having a lot of dialogue about something is not as interesting as actually showing it play out. Uh, and it, uh, but in a role-playing game, I think that dynamic is reversed in that uh, just uh, the GM describing a scene in detail is less interesting than having the players ask a series of questions about a past event. So the necessity of doing that is sort of cinematic, uh, whereas... Um, if you are, and I haven't read the novel of Horns, but I bet that that's just uh, actually laid out uh, conventionally in the novel and it's just all done with dialogue between the investigator and the witness. Uh, so I'm not sure of the necessity of actually emulating that device uh, in role playing because I think it solves a particularly cinematic problem. Yeah, I play around sometimes with uh, uh, use of flashbacks in order to introduce, let the players experience doing something. Yeah. Um, uh, like, for instance, if you, uh, uh, let's mention we're running Goliath again, and I don't want to have to do the uh, exposition narrative to be able to talk to them about something that happened three, four years ago until it starts becoming relevant for the characters. And people always have, a, in role-playing games, you know, my take on it is is exactly what Robin said is, is that it's it's people have a much stronger emotional connection to stuff that their characters do as to having the GM describe it. But then it always runs into the problem of well what happens if the characters do something phenomenally stupid in the flashback that affects uh, <laughs> <laughs> invalidates <Right. laughs> kill their father or yeah. well or, or got killed. <laughs> right. or, um, so, so as you suggest, yes, there are all sorts of other great uses for flashbacks in a, a role-playing context. And one of them is 
to actually go back and show the characters doing things. But one of the things that I would solve that problem with is just uh, the rules don't come into it. And so when you do something stupid, you did, so a, a flashback involving your own characters, if you go back to, you know, how did you manage to get exiled from the clan? Um, well, first of all, that's about something dumb happening. Um, but, uh, you know, and then we fought back. Well, why didn't you get killed, right? So what you do there is the uh, descriptive turnaround technique where a problem of credibility comes up uh, and it's not your job as the GM to solve problems of credibility, it's the players. Uh, if, if it's a credibility problem involving their characters and their actions, it's like, uh, so if they propose doing something that, you know, and then I went up and punched the king. It's like, oh, you went up and punched the king, so why aren't you dead? Um, and so that allows them to do something stupid and then it give themselves their own punishment. And they'll always punish themselves worse than you would. Yeah. <laughs> um, another thing that you can do with flashbacks uh, is to have them play other characters uh, and that will give them an emotional connection. So, for example, one of the things I suggested in the uh, fourth edition D&D &D, uh, uh, DM's Guide 2 is if you have a, uh, a sort of a monster of the week format you can have them all play the uh, red shirts who get killed at the beginning by the monster when the monster comes back. So you have a scene where that happens and then they can care about the fact that this monster is on the loose. And then after that sort of opener, you can have your credit sequence and then they are back to playing their regular characters showing up on the scene, finding you know the remains of all the people who were killed on the watchtower by the creature. And, but it seems more real to them because they've been through the process of, uh, you know, being eaten by their by the monster, and then they're back into the role of their regular characters. And also introduces to the key, to the uh, the players just how tough that monster is. And, yeah. Uh, hopefully, puts the the players on alert that this is something they have to take very seriously. Yeah, and and it just establishes there's disorder in the world. And it's your job to bring order to it, which is the, the job of any serial hero. Except the murder hobos. Um, well, they're not really heroes. <laughs> but, but even murder hobos, uh, you know, are generally, uh, they're usually killing worse things in the world that are described. You know, there's usually a justification given for a game with murder hobos for their, to go around being murder hobos. And they're, uh, perhaps introducing some disorder into the world, but they're rectifying a, a greater disorder. And that's why, because murder hobos come from the Old West, D&D uh, &D is basically a Western in, in Tolkien drag. Uh, you know, the theme of the Western, of course, is that the, uh, the man who picks up the gun uh, protects society, but then is outside society and has to continue to move on. So that's sort of your justification for murder yeah. hobos, really. But your uh, your Shane, basically, in the, the movie Shane, and you have to leave at the that's end. That's the best justification I've ever heard. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, um, I know we've had sort of a couple of side conversations, but I don't mind we're having a real conversation. Um, in, in the words, the question I have asked you is, uh, how do you make the Nature of hero quests, which are you kind know, of like you have the myth, and then you basically follow the myth. Right. Kind of How do you make that more interesting to players than simply following the the route? So, what you focus on in the in the hero quest is not uh, the story of the the myth and just reenacting it because that's boring. But what are the choices that you make that are specific to what you do in the hero quest uh, along the way, and what uh, the consequences of those choices are. So the suspense is not, will we, uh, the suspense might be, for instance, will we succeed in f doing the entire hero quest instead of getting, you know, dumped back out into the ordinary world? There's some suspense in that, but you know, uh, but it, it's boring if you're just trying to do exactly what uh, the god you're emulating uh, does. So, uh, but all of the myths have wiggle room in them. There's variant versions of all the myths, and when you, you get to uh, the uh, hero plane or the gods' war, as, uh, as I've 
take into calling it. You get to the gods. Well, the gods' war is actually a place of utter chaos and madness and uh, in, insanity. And so you're actually, when you get there, you're trying to impose your version of the narrative <coughs> on something that's much uh, more chaotic and strange than you actually expected or that you will describe when you get home and put it in the clan saga. So uh, there's all sorts of choices then when we envision it that way uh, as uh, a, a, a place of disorder that you're trying to impose order on. How do you try to impo impose that order? And even a very simple situation, it's, you know, where, uh, okay, I'm uh, reaching the part in the myth where Orlant uh, protects uh, Uralda, the cow goddess, by uh, convincing her cows to go uh, into the great storm barn. Uh, well, how exactly do you, do you convince them by shaking your rattle? Do you convince them by... Uh, throwing your thunderbolt, you can, and all of these things would have different difficulty levels, and then the player has to figure out, okay, so what's, what am I best at? Or rather, which one of those is most likely to appeal to cows? Do cows like rattles more than they like thunder? Or, you know, perhaps they need me to identify myself as Arnaldo's husband. Uh, maybe I need to command the cows. Maybe I need to... Uh, uh, placate the cows. So all of a sudden, the question, how do I do this, becomes the point of suspense. And it's a, point, it's a choice point as well. And the, uh, the trick is to give them some means of guessing which one is the best one uh, and which one is maybe the worst one, uh, but not give it away so that they still have some reason to uh, think what they can do. Uh, another way to, to deal with that is you don't uh, necessarily want failure at any station to totally knock you out of the, uh, the God's War, uh, but instead it can just cause a problem or reduce an opportunity for you later. So let's say you don't quite get uh, the cows into the storm barn. Uh, you know, you only get a few cows into the storm barn. You get enough of them in that you, you know, can move on to the story, or just that the rest of the story is not contingent on whether the cows go into the barn or not. At the end of the, uh, the quest, uh, I, I think it's uh, dramatically more, uh, dramatically richer to offer alternate rewards when you get to the end of the quest. So uh, you finally do all of these things and you meet Orlanth and he says, you know, thank you for helping me uh, uh, assist in this, uh, in this war against the, the newtlings. Uh, and uh, what reward do you want? Now, maybe you came to uh, the hero plane hoping to uh, get Orlanth to build a fortification that protects your own cattle. But then he said, do you want the fortification? Or how would you just like greater personal power? How would you like the ability to throw my thunderbolts further than anybody? Or how would you like uh, me to make... Uh, uh, a temple uh, so full of storm that your enemies will come and beg you for peace. So now you have another choice to make. And so it's all about finding what appears to be a linear narrative, uh, but that's just one version of the story, and you get to make your own version of the story and, and decide what the choice points are. And uh, you get bonus points as, as a GM or scenario writer if you can then make some of those points contingent on who that person is. So, of course, uh, the best way to do that is to know what the uh, character would probably want. Like maybe the character uh, has always wanted to uh, build peace between his clan and his neighbors, even though other members of the uh, clan uh, favor war. But he's been sent to build a fortification, and he's got a chance to make peace well, here's my chance to further my agenda. I'm the big hero. I did all these things. But maybe my clan won't be so happy when you come back and say, you know what? I got something better than a fortification. <laughs> I've got peace. Mm -hmm. And so then you've got... Uh, yeah. So then you've got, got zippy lightning bolts yeah. for me. <laughs> so then you've got a... a, a yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and they might... Uh, and 
you know, if you're successful enough, you, then you make your, your oratory challenge and you convince them, what we really needed is for me to have lightning bolts. <laughs> Fortification does only one thing, but lightning bolts are multi-purpose. <laughs> so, so again, it's, it's about making sure that you're not just, that they're not just a spectator making roles as they go through the myth as they know it, but that there are all kinds of uh, uh, choices that were either too small for the myth to note or uh, too big and strange for the myth to predict. Yeah, how far can you go as a GM or maybe as a system of rules into regulating the uh, inner processes, meaning the emotions and thoughts of characters in the game? I mean, ideally, the players are just completely immersed in their characters, but maybe in order to maybe enforce some sort of role um, playing, you can maybe, I don't know. Well, uh, I, I think you're asking me to plug Hillfolk. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the thing about uh, characters' uh, inner thoughts and emotions mm -hmm. is that uh, they are static unless they meet some sort of opposition. Um, now sometimes you will have players who say, who will sort of take you through their character's thought process as they think their way through a problem. And so that's sort of like having an internal monologue. But really if you want to focus more on the character's personalities and their emotions, you need to pit them against other characters in dramatic scenes. And uh, for those of you who don't know Hillfolk, that's what Hillfolk is all about, the drama system game. is a, uh, takes all of the procedural action of, you know, do you uh, solve the mystery or do you drive away the orcs and puts that in the background. And what it foregrounds is the emotional consequence of doing all of those things. And it has a scene structure uh, and uh, has you create the characters in a way that makes that the whole objective of the thing. Now, once you start playing with Hill Folk, uh, once you go to other games, uh, sometimes I found that the players then want to use the approach that they developed in Hill Folk and sort of, and what you could do if you wanted is kind of bolt that on as kind of a secondary uh, system. Now, there's things you'd have to do to the economics of, of that game, and there's a column up on the Pelgrane Press site about how to do that. But uh, basically the answer is uh, emotional resonance in gaming has to come out of drama rather than any just sort of static one-person internal monologue. I have no question because I think that I'm good enough. So, um, you know, I've been thinking about a question of something I, that could be better in my way of game mastery. And I didn't fault anything. Mm -hmm. that, right. That's not a natural answer. Right. But, and finally, it was a question. This may be a problem, you know. Some, at some point, you, you, everything is working well, and you don't feel the need to do something new. So, yeah, do, do you... Do well, you oh. Right, so, so the question is, can you get so good at GMing no, that it's, it's boring? Uh, how can you finally find new stuff to, right. to, to do when you think that you have everything? And obviously you can't have everything. You know? Right, so uh, if, if you want to mix things up and start uh, changing your GMing, uh, even though you feel it's at a high level, ask your players what your mannerisms are. Ask them, what... What do you, what what can you predict that I'm going to do? What do I do a lot? And then make a list of those things, and then start a campaign in which you promise yourself that you're not going to do any of those things, those usual things that you're drawing. So, for example, I tend to have a lot of games where people are in contact with gods or changing the nature, uh, or determining the nature of religions, and uh, uh, sort of being there to, to you know, develop a religion from scratch because that's something that interests me but it interests me so much that I can draw on that too often and so if I was going to have a, a game where I you know, struck out some of my usual mannerisms one of those would be okay I'm going to do a campaign where uh, 
religion is just sort of a static thing and there's no way of changing it and the characters are never going to uh, incarnate, talk to uh, gods, nor are they going to uh, get involved in uh, theological uh, discussions. It's just not an issue in this campaign. Or the uh, sort of uh, charming, friendly villain who uh, freaks you out by, by helping you and establishing sort of a frenemy relationship is also something that I do a lot. So uh, for the ca course of a campaign, I might also say, okay, well, okay, this time uh, all the bad guys are just going to be uh, bad and uh, they're not going to be charming or nice and they're never going to offer sort of a devil's bargain. So, uh, and that sort of, and that's another mannerism is that I often have uh, players uh, making a pact uh, with the devil. And uh, you were in the Hellfolk uh, yes. session yesterday and uh, guess what? There's a snake who offered the <coughs> characters something very tempting. Um, and so that's a, 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 and the reason I use that all the time is it's such a powerful device and it gives the players a tough choice uh, between, you know, oh, you, you, this is what you want, you can have what you want, but you have to compromise who you are in order to get it. So that might be another thing that, you, that I would strike out. Um, and every GM is going to have a different list of things that they, that they always do. And it might be, you know, I really like uh, eventually having a big confrontation at the moot. Well, okay, if there's no, there's, I'm going to do something with no crowd scenes this time. And so it's a matter of sort of tying one hand behind your back and, and still having to come up with something that's just as interesting as theological conflict or group uh, scenes. Uh, one of my experiences is that some players they tend to, uh, tend to, to always want to succeed. So particularly again, like right, Hero Quest you find, they, they don't want to lose the contest. They'll throw hero points at it, etc. And quite often that you know, they don't necessarily that losing the contest means the end, the event just goes in a different direction. So how, how do you persuade players to break from this cycle of losing is bad, winning is good? Um, I, I, think you're, I think that would entail fundamentally altering human psychology, mm -hmm. that of course it's <laughs> natural for people to want to succeed when they're in a situation where the question is, do I succeed? Um, and uh, to just give them a victory every so often, right? That it may be that they, what you perceive as they always want to win. Well, of course they always want to win, but maybe they're not getting enough wins. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not getting enough up points. And so, uh, because as a GM, it's always, it's child's play to come up with the sudden con uh, consequence of victory uh, that it turns out to be, you know, you thought you wanted this and now you've got it and, oh, here's another problem. And every so often you might want to say, okay, well, things are just really great in, in the clan for an entire year. And things are going really swimmingly, the cattle are fat, the crops were great, uh, you've had positive trading relationships, uh, the clan you were feuding with came over and they decided to, uh, that'll freak them out. That, you know, as soon as you say, everything's fine and... Nobody needs, anything. Nobody needs anything, and everything's cool. That'll that'll really make them nervous. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing more alarming than that. Um, but let them feel a sense of victory for a while, and then uh, you know go back to uh, and, and uh, you know the, the fact is that of course uh, they would be bored if they won all the time. So uh, you know let them win a little more, and then they'll be uh, I think uh, happier to face some adversity. Okay, you had a question, Jenny. Yeah, it's more a technical question. Um, I like simple and unified systems, you know, rules, lives, um, and, and systems. And sometimes you want to focus on a particular mechanism or area of the game where you have to introduce complexity. So how would you balance these two things? And it's a good question. Um, so I, get, I guess the issue basically is <laughs> if you train your players to also enjoy simplicity and then you hit sort of a subsystem that, okay, here's this, well, like for example, in Ashen Stars, um, Gumshoe is a really simple system, but space combat is a little more complex. And so what you do is you make sure that, okay, 
space, our first space combat is just going to be the cool, fun thing we do tonight. And it's going to be the whole focus of the deal. And so uh, really make them anticipate uh, this new system that has a little higher handling cost and uh, understand what the consequences are of success or failure and just kind of prepare them in, okay, this one's a little more complicated and we're going to have fun, you know, we're just going to have fun doing it. And uh, also, as GM, be really prepared in knowing that new system uh, and before you start playing. Because if you're fumbling to understand it, you'll lose the room and they'll uh, think of it as being twice as complicated as it actually is. And the way to understand a complicated subsystem is to read it and then break it down into a point form reference sheet. There may already be a reference sheet, but you may actually find it more uh, useful to do that yourself because that's part of the process of learning it. So breaking it down into bullet points and maybe running even like a, a practice one yourself. Uh, you know, here I'm just going to run a whole space combat playing all the characters. And then if you're really sharp uh, and able to uh, deliver all those things crisply, uh, it will, the, the, the handling cost uh, will be much less than your players might not even notice that it's a more complex part of the system. Yeah, I had a question that was a bit uh, the, the follow up of uh, Ian's one regarding the uh, winning or, of, or having a failure. It's regarding the uh, hero points or whatever we have on, on, on other games, etc. That's Basically, it's a way for the, for the players to take the control and maybe to, to, to succeed where they, they had uh, failed. So I, I don't like that. And I have uh, my player knows that I don't give so many uh, your points if you do that. So what is your opinion on that and uh, how to make it, how to find the right balance by having this kind of uh, uh, um, artificial way to give uh, Power to the players. Well, as you say, the whole point of hero points or their equivalent is to say at certain points in the narrative, you, the player, are going to have the power to decide what you really want to happen. And uh, I, that's an actual important valve, uh, in, and it's really about being open to collaboration from the players. And so it requires you to be ready to improvise because if you planned for a particular thing to lead to a defeat that then kicks off the rest of the story, you have to, in a system that has hero points, you have to uh, be prepared to say, well, what if they you know, do really well when they're expected to fail? How can I make sure that there's still an interesting series of events after that? But uh, from the player's point of view, if they never have, if, if they feel they never really have opportunity to affect the narrative, and that their failures are kind of inevitable, that takes away their feeling that their choices matter. That it's just, oh, th um, and uh, you can certainly make things very difficult, but, uh, you know, hero points are there for a reason, and they're the reason that you're uncomfortable with, but it's that, you know, you have to be willing to let your uh, players help shape what's going to happen. And it will, I submit to you, annoy you less if you already know what to do if they decide to spend their hero points at this particular time. Now, obviously you don't want to dole out so many hero points that they can constantly use them. Uh, but another thing you can do is introduce the what seems like the big problem that uh, they're going to want to spend a hero point on. Then you just, that's actually there just to soak up that hero point. Right, that you can give them, and that gives them that their sense that they've uh, had a big success that they really wanted to have, but that's not the big success that worries you because you've got another one down the line and now they've spent that hero point. So if, you, if there's a time when you really want to kind of cheat a system that has that, uh, you know, give them another reason to spend a hero point before they get there. <laughs> so that, now in a way, that's the... So you've given them the, the illusion of choice instead of actual choice. And many theorists would say that uh, uh, you should always give your players actual choice. And I would say that most of the time, too. But, you know, uh, being a storyteller is being a trickster. And so if the trick works, it works. 
However, if they start to notice that there's always a pair of big obstacles <laughs> and one of them encourages to spend their hero point, then you'll have to go back to the real ground zero of being ready for them to, to succeed and have a surprising success. Because uh, you know, in real life, big successes are often uh, as much trouble as big failures. So uh, you, know, you can ask yourself, what, what trouble can they get into by succeeding in this scene? Anybody else? Well, I have, I have one uh, about the hero quest also. This, when you make a scenario and play it, uh, do you usually, is there like a one big final contest that actually uh, tells everything about how the heroes, so how, how big they succeed, or, or is it, does the previous ones also count? So. Do you know where I'm getting so? Right. So um, I, I think you want to structure things so that uh, you have to look at any pre-written adventure, whether it's a fully pre-written adventure or a series of notes that you've scrawled in a napkin ten minutes before you start, as your fallback position. Right. That there, you know, at least one fun thing that you can deliver for your players that night, and it's this. Um, but you can be prepared nonetheless for them to go in a different. Uh, direction and uh, and as they go in that different direction, you can sometimes cannibalize things from the uh, scenario that they've then sort of uh, obviated. And this is easier to do in simpler systems and harder to do in hard systems, which is why Chaosium is getting ready to sell you a whole lot of RuneQuest template encounters that you can slot into uh, whatever situation comes up. Um, but in general players will tend to find the story that you've laid out for them and move toward it because they think that's what's going to be fun. And so often, yes, I do try to structure things so that there is a big uh, encounter at the end that uh, changes it, uh, you know, that's the big deal showpiece of the, of the thing, but that they couldn't have reached or gotten to or wouldn't want to get to without the previous events that they've gone through. So um, it's really a matter of, I think, the rest of the story lays the emotional groundwork for whatever the big confrontation is. So if you introduce a problem early on and winning at this big confrontation at the end solves that problem, um, you know, nine times out of ten, that's going to satisfy most uh, players because I think players, uh, except in a total sandboxy environment, uh, kind of want a sense of where they should go, and you can make them want that by giving them an emotional stake in things. So if if just a uh, if you start your adventure by some boring guy with money offers them money in order to do something, they're not going to be that invested in it. But it's like if you uh, go and, and fight the newtlings, then you will protect these people you really like. That gives you more of an investment, and you're uh, less concerned about, uh, you know, totally throwing in the towel on that adventure and you're going to move uh, toward it and toward that, you know, final resolution. But, but yeah, basically the answer is uh, have a big thing at the end. It's not necessarily going to be what happens. Maybe it's going to be a modified version of that. Uh, but at least it's, it's there that there is a series of events that people can go through and have a fun time that night. And then that might, that's plan A. Sometimes you use plan A. Often you do, because often players are happy to go with plan A because they want to have fun too, and they assume that they, you've got something fun for them at the end. Uh, but within that, they want to feel that they have choices. Any other questions? What I talked a little bit is um, what are the ways to really create a fear? In fact, that's going to sound terrible. The last one about you know players and failure and players and fear and having an evil gym. But um, um, if you want players to, to experience fear, what are the sort of best techniques to use in that? Um, I think the well, there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, one of them is to sort of slowly take away uh, tools and options that they have. That uh, when you enter into a horror game you're kind of uh, upending a lot of the assumptions that we have about uh, you're slowly 
taking away options and agencies and moving them toward uh, something terrible. Uh, and that can be, well, now they're in a confined space uh, or uh, now they're uh, moving towards something that will ch alter their perceptions um, and uh, they're not, their perceptions are unreliable. So all things that sort of throw things that they normally rely on in doubt, right? Or uh, so, uh, you know, if you have uh, sort of purist Cthulhu players or sort of pulp pulpy Cthulhu players and you want to scare them, well, guess what? Your guns have all gone missing. What? And you know, so take things away from them. It's a process of, of uh, attrition. And, uh, and so um, you don't want to make them feel completely trapped and helpless, but they've agreed to play a horror game. They've agreed, you know, at some point, they're going to feel pretty trapped and pretty helpless. And so it sort of takes all of the assumptions that we have from more aspirational genres like fantasy and turns them on their head. So, you know, if you sign up to play murder hobos and all of a sudden all of your powers get taken away from you and you end up in a cave with some uh, monsters, you'll feel ripped off and railroaded. But if you're uh, saying, this is a horror game about being in a cave with monsters you can't see, and they're all down for that. It's like, oh, well, that's exactly what I wanted. And oh boy, I died. You know, I had the best death of anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but then, I'm just going to follow up to that. I'm not, it's more a question of am I completely on the mark? When we talk about the last fail on cycle architecture, there's this normal kind of action movie genre right. which just kind of builds and you get successes, etc. But you find the, 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 the greatest resistance almost seems to come in the end. Is the horror movie work the other way? Is it in reverse? And essentially, the, 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 the bad is essentially at its best abilities right at the beginning when it kind of sorted its way for everybody. But by the end, when the, uh, and it, the, the final confrontation comes, because the heroes discover the weakness is actually the resistance is the lowest of the, of the whole sort of thing. Well, it depends on whether the horror is uh, aspirational. It's about confronting uh, a terrible force and surviving, or whether it is a, uh, uh, truly horrific in the Lovecraftian sense of you encounter this thing and you discover that it's way worse than, it, than you possibly thought it was at the beginning. You know, initially you thought you just had a bunch of weird letters from your uncle and by the end you find out that there's a globe-spanning conspiracy of people uh, uh, worshipping this uh, uh, creature that lives in the South Pacific and was temporarily dealt with but is coming back. And uh, under that second paradigm, the further you go into the story, the worse it gets. Uh, but if it's about, uh, you know, a more traditional, you, you know, yeah, or, um, well, Teen Slasher, everybody dies but one. Yeah. So uh, five out of six of the players at the table are going to think <laughs> it's pretty bad. And, uh, or, you know, but I guess a real example is actually horror adventure, right? Like Buffy the Vampire Slayer right, yeah. is... A, an actual, it's a heroic action movie story set in a horror movie world. So the question is, uh, you know, is Buffy meant to actually be terrifying or chilling, or is it meant to be empowering? Well, it's meant to be empowering, clearly, uh, but it just has the trappings of the horror genre. Um, whereas, and, and so in that case, yes, the monster is at its worst at the very beginning, and the more you learn about it, the uh, more control you have over what's going on, and uh, finally, you restore order the way any iconic hero does. Uh, but uh, you know, a, a, a true existential horror works the other way around. Well, I think we've uh, gone for about an hour, and I hear people eating our food that we should be getting. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you, everybody, for your great thank you. questions, and thanks for coming. Thank you.